Welcome to Socials with the Saints. Are you looking for hope and inspiration? Grab a cup of tea or your favorite beverage and spend some time with us as we meet role models throughout church history and discuss how they can help us in our daily pilgrimage of life. Hello and thank you for joining us. Welcome to Socials with the Saints. Our mission is to inspire you in your daily pilgrimage of life by introducing you to the communion of saints. I'm Jason Nunez, Media Production Coordinator for Pilgrim Center of Hope. Joining us today is Angela Celiana, Media Coordinator for Pilgrim Center of Hope. Hi, everyone. Socials with the Saints are opportunities to learn from role models of faith and from one another for fellowship, prayer, and receiving spiritual tools. So today we will be shining a light on a gifted musician and a Canadian nun who had a deep devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, Blessed Dina Belanger. Yes, this Socials with the Saints will be a time to be encouraged and inspired for your daily life. Now, Angela, I was actually blessed with the opportunity to attend our monthly in-person Socials with the Saints events about Blessed Dina Belanger. Uh, for me, it was a treat because in the past couple of socials with the saints, I hadn't had the opportunity right. to attend. And, you know, I look forward to those every month. So, you know, this definitely was a special time for me. Uh, Missionary of Hope, Gina Harward, was gracious enough not only to compile information about the life of Blessed Dina, but she also hosted the event, which, yes. which for us and our staff is much appreciated and a big deal to us. Yes. And we specially appointed Gina for that role. Um she, um, she's a wonderful missionary of hope, and we're so grateful for her. Yes, indeed. So we do definitely want to give a shout out to Gina, because not only did she get the information and host, but she's a regular attendee along with her mother. So definitely great to see her go from sitting on the table to standing behind the podium and helping out in such a big way. Uh, and I must say, it truly was time well spent. Uh, those in attendance left with a greater understanding about the life of this saint in the making. And, uh, this episode is for you, listeners, so it's your turn, right? So for those who are listening, if you're in San Antonio, Texas area, you are invited to join us on the third Thursday of every month in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, please visit pilgrimcenterofhope.org for more information about our in-person socials with the Saints gatherings. These events are always fun, and they are definitely inspiring. So now let us take a dive into, th into the life of Blessed Dina. Angela. Can you please start by giving us some basic information about her, please? Yes, sir. So Blessed Dina was born and baptized on April the 30th, 1897 in Saint-Roch, Quebec. And for all of my Canadian and French-speaking folks, um, please extend us some grace as we attempt to uh, pronounce these names here. Dina died on September the 4th, 1929. And she was beatified by Pope St. John Paul II on March 20th, 1993. So what kind of upbringing did she have? Well, let me tell you about her family. So her parents were Olivier Octave Belanger and Serafia Maté. They lived at, we even have their address, which is kind of cool, 168 Notre Dame de Sange in the parish of Jacques Cartier. And Dina would have only one younger brother. His name was Joseph Simeon Gustave, but he died at the age of three months. So essentially, she was an only child as far as her upbringing. Uh, Dina's father was an auditor, and her grandfather operated a grocery store in the St. Malo district of Quebec. Now, Dina was surrounded by love and showered with blessings. And we can see this in the names that her parents chose for her. Her complete name is Marie Marguerite Dina Adelaide. Marie for the Blessed Mother, Marguerite for St. Marguerite Marie Alacoque, to whom Jesus appeared and gave the Sacred Heart devotion, and Dina Adelaide in honor of her paternal grandmother. So really nice. Dina's parents provided her with tender care, religious formation, and an example of Christian virtue. Um, she would say her prayers leaning against her father's knee, head bowed, and hands joined. And she loved the Angelus prayer. Whenever she heard the bell ring for the Angelus, 
while she was playing outside, she would run upstairs in time to say amen, which was all the Latin that she knew. (laughs) (laughs) Angela, I love this. It's such a a little kid thing to do, right? Like doing air quotes here, little kid thing to do. (laughs) So uh, what else can you share about her upbringing? Well, her mother liked to take Dina on errands of mercy. Both of her parents provided all sorts of services to the poor and needy, but they were discreet and they often asked to remain anonymous in their charity. So she had that witness. Additionally, several of their relatives were in religious orders and often Dina would go with her mother to visit them as well. Um, Dina received her first communion two days after her 10th birthday. And during her retreat to prepare for it, she heard that, quote, a fervent first communion was a sure passport to heaven and a lukewarm one, a ticket to hell, unquote. So since she wanted to, in her words, take the train to paradise, Dina prepared for her first confession with the help of her mother. Um, Dina accused herself of many faults. But she was certain that she had not lost her baptismal innocence, and she expressed an intense gratitude to our Lord and Our Lady for this favor. The same day as her First Communion, Dina received the Sacrament of Confirmation, which is customary in many places still to this day. She was also invested in the scapulars, which perhaps is customary at the time, and some families carry on that tradition also to this day. Now, if you'd like more information about scapulars, Stay tuned to our other Pilgrim Center of Hope podcast, because I think that's a great topic to discuss. It certainly is. (laughs) In the following days after Dina's first communion and confirmation, Dina grew more recollected at prayer. She was not moving unnecessarily during prayer or taking her eyes from her prayer book. So focused. Another thing about her spiritual life is that she had a very tender conscience. In her youth, she experienced scrupulosity. But she had a wise priest named Father Philemon Cloutier who helped her and directed her to find peace amidst this challenge. So take the train to paradise. Mm -hmm. You know, that sounds like such a great phrase for a (laughs) T-shirt. Angela, you can attest every now and then I have these T-shirt ideas that just kind of come up every now and then. It's like, that's the the thought there. That would be a great T-shirt right there. Yeah. I digress, though. (laughs) It sounds like from a young age, Dina had great love for Jesus and wanted to remain close to him. Trials of trials of scruples, uh, they're they're definitely that's something that's experienced. And it can be, you know, quite frankly, paralyzing at times. Uh, During this in-person event, Gina shared that Blessed Dina heard the voice of Jesus uh, can you please share this with our listeners? Yeah, so she she heard this several times in her life. So let's start with the first time. Mm-hmm. On March 25th, 1908, which was Holy Thursday that year, Dina heard the voice of Jesus for the first time. She says, quote, During my act of thanksgiving after communion, our Lord spoke to my soul by means of a new light. This was the first time I heard his voice so well, interiorly, of course, a soft, melodious voice, which overwhelmed me with happiness. Very, very interesting. Uh, How did she continue her spiritual journey? Well, at the age of 13, she was admitted to the Sodality of Our Lady, which is like a small group of people committed to growing in their faith. And she took as her personal motto at that time, quote, death rather than defilement. So you can see she was very serious about maintaining her purity of heart. She consecrated herself to Jesus through Mary using the true devotion model by St. Louis Marie de Montfort. This consecration brought her great joy and peace. Dina wrote, Would that I might consecrate all souls to Mary. It is she who leads us to Jesus. It is she whom we must allow to live in us in order that Christ may substitute himself in place of our nothingness. Between the ages of 16 and 19, while Dina lived at home quietly with her parents, she adopted a personal rule of life with set times for morning and evening prayer, communion, rosary, meditation, and weekly confession. Despite this, she strove to conceal this deep interest that she had in the spiritual life 
and she trusted that God was acting within her. So in other words, she didn't kind of tell everybody, oh, you know, guess what I'm doing? <laughs> I'm working on my spiritual life. Right, right. It's, it's She didn't at the time, but it's good to know that now because it's, mm -hmm. you know, some some here, you know, the rule of St. Benedict and, you know, we've, you know, even a thought I had when when going through the information was, wow, I can make a rule, of, rule for my life too. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, so she did. And during this time, Dina was also active in the parish life. She uh, joined the Tabernacle Society, where she, her mother, and other ladies would make or embroider holy vestments. Dina joined her mother in the Apostleship of Prayer, which uh, continues this to this day, and it spreads devotion to the Sacred Heart. And she helped to distribute their monthly prayer leaflets. Um, when World War I began, 17-year-old Dina offered herself to Jesus, quote, in a spirit of reparation and love in order to give him some consolation and save souls. Dina was especially distressed at the moral evil threatening the world. And a little later, she offered herself as a, quote, victim of divine love. So what does that mean? Basically, Dina was telling God that she was willing to bear her sufferings out of a spirit of love and reparation as a spiritual sacrifice. She believed that this radical attitude of prayer could cooperate with God's grace to bring about healing and peace amidst the evil of her times. An inspiring path, I must say. Yes. Uh, also, uh, being an active participant in the activities of one's parish, it's certainly a wonderful way not only to experience community, but also to stay close to Jesus, which is certainly something that that the blessed that blessed Dina had a priority for, right? True. Stay close to Jesus. Stay close to Mary. So, at the beginning of the episode, you mentioned Dina was a gifted musician. When did she begin to show an interest in music? Yeah. So, at age eight, she had begun taking piano lessons from a private teacher, who regularly came to their family home for four years. And Dina plunged into music with great zest. She said, though always in moderation on account of my health. She quickly advanced in piano and in musical composition so that even her spiritual guides encouraged her to glorify God by pursuing this as a career. Therefore, at the age of 19, her parents sent her for musical studies to the New York Conservatory of Music very distinguished school, where she and two friends from Quebec lodged at a convent of the Order of the Religious de uh, Jesus and Marie. Uh, all the while, Dina was deepening in prayer and growing in virtue. She would go to the convent chapel often to visit Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. In one of her reflections on this, she wrote, How often, late in the evening, by the pale flickering of the sanctuary lamp, have I come close to Jesus, and there, leaning against the altar rail, listened to his voice and poured forth the secrets of my heart. Wow, Angela, thanks for sharing this. Uh, something that strikes me, you know, as, as you share this with us, it's, it, there's a mention of Dina leaning against her father's lap when she would say her prayers as a youth. And with, and with, of course, with, with of course, what you just shared, Dina specifically mentioned leaning on the altar rail. There was really something to this, you know, mm -hmm. we're getting this from her writings, you know, of her leaning against the altar rail. There's, she wrote it down. So there mm -hmm. must be, there's something there to that, you know, can't help but, but wonder there. Yeah. It seems that during this time, uh, this time in Dina's life, she was very close to Jesus. So just, you know, the, the question is, did she experience any type of hardship as it relates to her faith? Yeah, so at this time, Dina experienced the dark night of the soul, where she entered spiritual aridity and dryness. This began while she was still in New York. Spiritual exercises for her became occasions for distraction and struggle, but she was still faithful in doing and even increasing in her spiritual exercises. She gave 20 and then 30 minutes for daily meditation. There was 10 minutes of spiritual reading often from the Imitation of Christ, Daily Rosary, or the Little Office of the Blessed Virgin. She made frequent use of short prayer phrases, and Dina prayed the Stations of the Cross and had a daily visit with the Blessed Sacrament. So this is a lot. So to get all of these things in during the day, 
She actually curtailed her hours of sleep. Sacrifice, right? You know, sacrificing sleep so that way she could do the things that she believed were a priority in her life. Uh, Angela, I'm not sure how you feel about this, but personally, whenever I hear of a real model of faith experiencing a dark night of the soul, uh, it helps me because I know that I'm not alone. You know, I, I have experienced spiritual dryness and I find comfort in knowing that others have experienced this and have risen above. You know, it certainly gives us hope. Uh, we, of course, can, can dive more into that in the second segment there. Sounds good. So let's keep our attention on Dina's journey to religious life. Um, when did she make the decision to become a sister? Well, she accepted her vocation, what she believed was her vocation. So she accepted it to the Religious de Jesus Marie, the same teaching order where she had boarded while studying in New York. She entered at Sillery, uh, Quebec, at age 24, on August the 11th, 1921. She received the name Mare, which means mother, Marie Saint Cécile of Rome, and took her final vows on August 25th, 1923. Uh, no surprise here, she taught music. <laughs> <laughs> Dina says that on her entrance day, her soul was filled with darkness and repugnance. Yet, she had scarcely crossed the threshold when an inward force made her say, this is home. She said her words, the words that she had there within her were not inspired by any natural feeling. She felt nothing. She was really groping her way in this spiritual darkness. However, a retreat that she had made before the novitiate stage of her formation as a sister gave her some consolation. The meditation during the retreat that struck her the most was on fidelity to little things. This is what she says. I was imbued with the thought that I should never be able to practice abnegation, which is another word for sacrifice, in important things if I did not generously accept small sacrifices. Dina received two graces in this retreat. First, she seemed to begin a new life. She plunged her past life into the precious blood of Jesus and drove it from her mind. The break with her former life was so complete that she felt as if she had died and been reborn. Amazing. Amazing. Praise be to God. So what's the second grace? Well, it's pretty remarkable. Dina was praying in the chapel at dusk on the last night of the retreat. Jesus spoke to her, filling her with love and with peace. Then, she says, my good master took my heart, picking it up as one removes an object and replacing it by his sacred heart and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. That was another picture, but there certainly took place in me a divine transformation that no pen could ever describe. I was lost in sentiments of gratitude and humility. I no longer had to look outside myself for the host and the star, Jesus and Mary, for I possessed them within me. Since that moment, I have acted and loved with the heart of my Savior and that of his Blessed Mother. I can only imagine the, the type of musician she was, you know, given where she studied and what's been shared. Mm -hmm. But something must be said about her writing. <laughs> yeah. It is truly beautiful. It's poetic. It really, really is. So how did these experiences impact her life going forward? She summed up her plan, her new plan of life in three phases. Blind obedience, to suffer joyously, and love unto martyrdom. Interestingly, soon after she professed novitiate vows, Dina contracted scarlet fever and entered isolation to avoid exposing the other sisters to her illness. Then in 1927, she received the wounds of the stigmata, the wounds of Christ on her body. Here is her recollection of this moment. Quote, During my meditation before the Blessed Sacrament exposed, I suddenly felt myself enveloped in profound peace. I felt that our Lord was granting me a great favor, the stigmata of his sacred wounds. From his divine heart, flames radiated, on the feet, hands, and heart of my annihilated being. The Blessed Virgin applied these flames to my hands and feet, 
and Jesus imprinted on them the stigmata of love of his sacred wounds. He was granting me one of my most cherished desires, but he astonished me by granting it at this moment when I was not expecting it, and in this manner, which I could never have imagined. Once again, poetic, mm-hmm. poetic and beautiful. Almost something I, I can picture happening as, right. as you're reading the words there. Uh, so what more can you share about the stigmata she received and her death? Right, so um, the stigmata remained invisible as she wished. After her death, nurses testified in the beatification process that they had noticed an expression of pain when her hands and feet were rubbed. The feet became so sensitive that it was impossible to rub them as before, and the pain was just too severe. Dina died in her 33rd year of life, some would say consumed more by love rather than tuberculosis. In the last entry of her Canticle of Love, which was written July 1929, she recorded these words, which she heard from the voice of Jesus. No invocation responds better to the immense desire of my Eucharistic heart to reign in souls than Eucharistic heart of Jesus, may thy kingdom come through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And to my no less infinite desire to communicate my graces to souls than Eucharistic heart of Jesus, burning with love for us, inflame our hearts with love for thee. Dina promised to be at the service of all of us, her brothers and sisters on earth. In anticipation of her death, she had said this, In heaven, I shall be a beggar of love. That is my mission, and I am beginning it here and now. I shall give joy. Such beautiful words from an amazing soul. Yes. Blessed Dina Belanger, pray for us. Pray for us. So we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll discuss how Blessed Dina can inspire and walk with us in our daily journey of life. So please stay with us as we continue our conversation. Hey, thanks for taking a break with us and the saints. We invite you to help spread the word about socials with the saints. How, you ask? It's simple. Step one, invite your friends to find the podcast on apps like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Amazon Music. It can also be found on Pilgrim Center of Hope's YouTube channel, Facebook page, or on our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. While you're at it, please follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Step two, if you listen using an app, please take a few seconds to give the podcast a positive rating and leave a comment or review. Your simple action will signal to the app that Socials with the Saints should be recommended to people who are browsing for a new podcast to listen to. As we say at Pilgrim Center of Hope, every little bit helps. Thanks for helping us to spread the word about Socials with the Saints. Now, let's dive back into the discussion. Welcome back. After meeting Blessed Dina, let's take some time to reflect on her life and discuss how it can inspire us. So, Angela, the magic question. Had you heard of her before? I had never heard of Blessed Dina Belanger before. Um, I believe it was our... uh, co-founder of Pilgrim Center of Hope, Mary Jane Fox, who had suggested her um, for this year for Socials with the Saints. And I was really surprised to learn that Canada had had its own little flower, as she's called. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You answered my next question was, <laughs> if you hadn't heard of her, how did she end up on our calendar? Right? So there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Had you heard of her before? <laughs> Definitely not. Definitely not. And kind of as I mentioned before we started recording, uh, I have a friend by the name of Dina. So mm-hmm. I'm very, very interested in sharing with my friend Dina, blessed Dina's life. Uh, mm-hmm. So that way, you know, I'm sure as it goes with, you know, folks who have names that are not too common, there there's an interest in kind of learning about the person. Right. And that- even in this instance, we have her home address, her childhood address. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I mean, there's so much about her that, you know, we we went through and it was sort of like, wow, you know, through a lot of different points. So, um, Jason, if you had to pick one thing, what what really struck you about Blessedina? 
Well, what really struck me was, you know, what we shared about her spiritual dryness. You know, I, I kind of shared a little bit there, you know, in between our conversation. Uh, but uh, that's something that I've experienced. And it's, you know, um, going through something personally that was very, you know, health related and very serious. Uh, I was suffering. And in those moments, I felt really close to God. And, you know, praise be to God. You know, I've I've had a tremendous blessing that has made me feel like I have the gift of life again. And there, there's times where I feel that dryness. And it's like, hey, wait a minute. You know, it's, I don't feel as close anymore, you know. And to me, it's, 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 it's sad, but it's also a way to, it's a way to motivate me to find a way to be close to God again, but this time with more life in me still. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very interesting feeling. It's yeah. a very, it, it's hard to put into words, but that really struck me about her, mm -hmm. you know, that she experienced that. Yeah. Um, I mean, if we could just, you know, jump into hardships, I think. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, she, I think that what struck me is her determination. Right. Um, mm -hmm. her determination to overcome those hardships. And um, I also think that it's good to see how she balanced her life. I mean, maybe for some people she didn't have such a balance um, because she was very fervent in um, her prayer life and her spiritual exercises. But at the same time, I think you do see that she kept that in mind as far as balance. Like she would practice her music, but only, you know, as it affected her, her life and her health. She mentioned her health specifically. Right. She didn't want to like go overboard and just, you know, do too much. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe she sacrificed a little bit of sleep so that she could <laughs> pray extra. Um, but it seems like, her being called to religious life, it's sort of like she was just starting her vocation a little early. <laughs> right, right. And we, we, we could even see that with her her, uh, her involvement with her parish, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, you don't see too many, you know, younger folks hopping in parishes when you do. It's a tremendous blessing. Uh, but, you know, from what we've learned, she just wasn't involved in one aspect of the parish, right? And uh, that's the wheels may have been turning at that time for her also, mm -hmm. right, as far as to what her path in life would be. Um, and, you know, sure, music entered the picture. You know, you, you mentioned earlier she went to a very noteworthy school, um, but she was still intentional about when she was going to school, she would go right to where the religious order was. So that way she can go in the chapel and she can, you know, go to church there. I believe she stayed there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, just some insight from our in-person event uh, Gina mentioned that the that her the two other friends that attended the school with her also became sisters as well. Mm. One with the same religious order as Blessedina, and one with another. But uh, you know, those three you know followed that similar path in life. Yeah, that's really cool, and it helps to have that structure. It helps to have the community. It helps to have the determination. I think you see all of those in her. Definitely, uh, definitely you do, and. The aspect of community is, is such such a important part of our faith, and sometimes it it's, doesn't get the light shined on it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, it's it's something where you you get hope from others, and you see others going going through their going through what they're doing, and maybe what they're experiencing, and it it gives you gives you the opportunity to witness that and persevere. Yeah, and it also helps us learn. You know, there's folks that are very different from me you know, personality wise and to be able to learn from them because they're also images of God, right? Right. A lot of times we want to stick with people who are very similar to us and, you know, like what I like and they do what I do. And, but it's good to be part of that parish community and to be part of a small, smaller community of, of friends, maybe, or family even who are different from you so that you can become holier in, in that way, because otherwise, how are you going to learn those things, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So um, so what do you think you're walking away with today, Jason, about, you know, learning from Blessedina and what, how can you be encouraged and, and challenged by Blessedina? Sure, sure. One of the big takeaways I have from learning about the life of Blessedina is that I can make a rule for my life. 
you know, it, it's something, you know, I'm uh, personally, I'm a very routine oriented person. Uh, but I, I feel like this as, as what I've come to learn, even from, even from like, say, St. Ben, Benedict and his role is the rule is a framework for your life, right? Uh, it's a way to provide structure. Uh, even if you tend to kind of go outside of, of your norm, these, this rule is a way to help keep you rooted, right? And what more be rooted in than is your faith. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so uh, creating that rule, I, I feel is something that's a big takeaway for me. How about you, Angela? Um, I have to say it's similar, I guess. I would just word it as like um, discipline, the importance of discipline, the importance of that discipline that she had even when she felt like, you know, oh my gosh, I'm so spiritually dry inside and I really don't want to do this like feeling wise, but she's still in her will. She wanted to follow Jesus and she wanted to be holy, you know, mm -hmm. and so she willed herself to doing these things, even to the point of, you know, entering the religious life. She knew that, you know, this is what I'm called to do, even though right now, for some reason, I don't emotionally feel like, oh, my gosh, overjoyed. I'm so excited. You know, like, I mean, sometimes we have to do those things, right? Like, you know, both you and I have a spouse and we, you know, have married life. And that's a vocation in and of itself that sometimes you have to put your will over like how you're personally feeling at the time, right? Indeed, indeed. Yeah, definitely you do. And you know, there are those times where you're like, okay, it's it's important to my spouse, therefore it's important to me. Yeah. Even though, you know, discussing what the topic is is not really something that I want to even remotely think <laughs> about at that moment, right? Uh, it's something where it's like, okay, it's, it's decompressed time. No, no, no. It's time to plan for the next week, mm -hmm. you know? So definitely. Yeah. If it's important to your spouse, it's important to you. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. I guess blessed Dina, you know, her spouse was the Lord Jesus. Yes. And she, she chose the Lord Jesus even in the times when she didn't feel like it. Right. Right. You figure, you know, it's the, when she was experiencing what she was experiencing, right. I believe it was when she was taking her vows, if I'm not mistaken, that's a time where you'd feel she would be overjoyed and can hardly contain her emotions, mm -hmm. right? And um, still went through with it. Yeah. Yes, indeed. So uh, so one of the great things about Socials with the Saints is not only that it includes this podcast that you're hearing right now, but great news. We also have some downloads for you to print, use, share, and it's all for free. It's not hiding behind a, a paywall or anything like that. This is... This, these are resources and tools that Pilgrim Center of Hope creates for you, the listener. Uh, so that way you can, once again, print, share, use. So just to, just to kind of give you an overview of what's available is a pamphlet about the life of Blessed Dina Belanger. We also have a card that has a quote from Blessed Dina. Uh, we have a prayer that was shared at the in-person meeting, at the in-person event. So that is included on our website. It's actually an intercessory prayer, so definitely want to go ahead and access that and take a look at it. And also, there's one more. We also have a picture with uh, a picture of Blessed Dina that you can save as a lock screen on your phone. Definitely a great way to be reminded of this amazing role model of faith throughout your day. If you think about it, how many times do we look at her phone? Mm -hmm. Many. If you program this as a lock screen on your phone, you have an image of her to kind of remember the example that she has for us. Right. Yeah. And these free resources are definitely wonderful. We're really glad to be able to provide them to you from Pilgrim Center of Hope. And now the time has come for us to share our favorite quotes of Blessed Dina. Um, my favorite quote of, you know, as you were talking about just how beautiful her writing was, <laughs> um, I just loved that she said, in heaven, I shall be a beggar of love. That is my mission, and I'm beginning it here and now. I shall give joy. I really appreciate um, her vision of her eternal life is like an extension of her life now, and so she's just going to get started right now. <laughs> so right. I, I think it's great. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So th this is my quote here, Angela. Mine is, love and let Jesus and Mary have their way, which I think is such an important example because we, we all want to do things our way. Right. <laughs> you know, and there's times where we do things our way and we're just gently reminded, no, 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 that's not the path. 
and we persist and we still get reminded, no, no, no. And when we turn around and look back, we realize we should have just let Jesus and Mary have their way. <laughs> so let's all take this advice from Lisa Dina and love and let Jesus and Mary have their way. Amen. So as, of course, listeners, uh, we do begin to bring our time together to a close. We, we, of course, would like to share the prayer I mentioned earlier, which is the prayer for the intercession of Blessed Dina Belanye. Angela, would you please do us the honors and lead us in prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father of everlasting goodness, you put into the heart of Blessed Dina Belanger the burning desire to offer you, on behalf of all mankind, the infinite riches of the heart of Jesus present in the Eucharist, and to live like Mary, closely united to him whom she loved, with an undivided heart. May we, like her, find our joy in faithfully doing your will. And since you revealed to her your great desire to pour out upon the world the abundance of your graces, hear the prayer which we make for your greater glory and which we entrust to her intercession. Amen. Amen. Blessed Dina Belanger, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And if, you're, if, if you would like to have a copy of that prayer, as I mentioned earlier, uh, go to our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org, and you can find that on the, uh, the page associated with this particular episode here. So definitely recommend that you do that. And as, of course, uh, and as of course, we are coming to an end of our conversation for now. We definitely would like to continue that with you, listener. So the question for you is, what struck you the most about Blessed Dina? Please leave a comment on the YouTube or Facebook post that corresponds with this episode uh, or the podcast app that you're listening on. Or, of course, you can send us an email to ministry at pilgrimcenterofhope.org. And we look forward to seeing what you have to say. And maybe you'll hear your name on next month's episode. On behalf of Pilgrim Center of Hope, we're so grateful for this month's sponsors, Ernest and Dorothy Morris, who made this podcast episode possible. If you would like to join us as a missionary of hope, please visit our St. Joseph wish list. A link will be provided in the description of this episode. And we invite you to join us for our in-person Socials with the Saints events on the third Thursday of every month at Pilgrim Center of Hope. Please make sure that you like our Facebook page so that you can stay up to date with details about these wonderful events. Socials with the Saints podcast will continue in this discussion format for the remainder of 2023, which is a statement that, that I'm so, so happy to state right there. So please join us next month as we shine a light on St. Gertrude the Great, which is the only female saint with the title of the Great. Yes. So thank you very much for joining us on Socials with the Saints. We invite you to come visit Pilgrim Center of Hope and learn more about our threefold ministry of pilgrimages, conferences, and outreach. Visit pilgrimcenterofhope.org or call us at 210-521-3377. Until next time, remember, we are a pilgrim people, and on your journey, you are never alone in the communion of saints. May God bless you.